Sodom talks about a story where uh, angelic visitors in the disguise of human beings arrive at this town. And in the ancient world, there are no real hotels in antiquity. What you do is you, you come to the, the city gate. Uh, cities are surrounded by walls in this period. And you come to the city gate, and your presence at the city gate is a way of ma making known that you need shelter in that city, protection from forces that might be criminal elements. And so part of the uh, values of ancient Israelite society are hospitality, which means not just setting out your best dinnerware, but it means taking in uh, strangers into your home and providing shelter and protection for them while they're staying in your city. And this, in fact, Lot does in connection with this story. And um, a, the townspeople get word of the fact that uh, the, the whole premise, subtext here of this story is that it's an evil city. People do pretty much what they want in their own eyes to do whatever they want to do. And uh, it's not a place to be left unsheltered and unprotected in. So they hear about these visitors in the city and they come around uh, Lot's house and they want to know the man. They want the man to be put out so that they can know them. Uh, in the context here, this clearly means to have sexual intercourse with the men. And Lot, uh, not sure of what to do, and sort of losing faith a little bit in God's power, throws out his daughters instead. Not that he wants his daughters to experience the sexual abuse that will occur, but he's bounded by two things. Number one, the conventions for hospitality in the ancient world and the sacredness of that, and not wanting to ex be guilty of exposing visitors uh, to this kind of heinous offense. And the other is that, understood in the text, homosexual practice is regarded as a double offense, not simply an offense uh, that's given to uh, the offense of rape, of coercive sexual intercourse, but also the additional problem of treating a person of the, as if they were the sex that they are not. And so that's what we have going on in the story. Uh, the question is whether the story would be indicting only coercive forms of same-sex intercourse or whether it would also be indicting homosexual practice. Is homosexual practice simply an ancillary or uh, rather a coincidental element of the story that doesn't really have a bearing on the indictment of what's taking place? Or is it a component, is it part of a multiple series of offenses that define the city of Sodom as particularly bad? I would argue it's the latter, and there's a number of different reasons why. We can look at a sort of, think of, think of a, the Sodom story at the center of a series of concentric circles, where the concentric circles around the Sodom story involve uh, context issues, literary context, other stories uh, by the same writer, and historical context, understanding the context of the story in the ancient Near East and ancient Israel generally. And when we do that, we come to the conclusion that this story is indeed indicting homosexual practice per se as an additional offense to the offense of coercive sexuality, uh, in addition to the inhospitality of the invited visitors into the town and treating them abusively. So again, how do we know that? Well, uh, the author of the story is the same author of the story in Genesis 2, uh, who writes about male and female, as we've already talked about, as two halves of an integrated sexual whole, where the clear implications of the story are that your sexual counterpart or complement with whom you could engage in a sexual union is not somebody of the same sex, but somebody of the sex that you are not. That's one element of the story, context. Another element of the literary context is the story about Ham and his father Noah. Now here's a story where Noah's drunk uh, in his tent and um, the story tells us that his son Ham sees the nakedness of his father. And uh, then he, his father wakes up and he realizes, Noah realizes that his son has done something to him, which is an unusual phrase simply for voyeurism. Uh, and then he issues, delivers a horrific curse on the descendants of Ham as a result of what Ham has done. Some people have argued this simply is about voyeurism, that he saw his father's nakedness, whether intentionally or not, and that this curse that comes on him as a result of that. There's actually some debate about this story in the uh, early rabbinic period, 
where some rabbis suggest no, that he basically committed sodomy against his father, basically uh, had sex with his father, penetrated his father as a way of indicating his superiority over his father. And there's some evidence for that. Seeing the nakedness of is a phrase that's used, for example, in Leviticus 18 and 20 for acts of sexual intercourse, not just merely seeing somebody, but it's a metaphor because of these acts regarded as so heinous, they talk about it in more oblique language. Then there's that remark that Noah says that he recognized when he came out of his stupor that something had been done to him. Just again, not the kind of language that's normally used uh, with regard to simply seeing something. Something, in fact, was done to him. Then there's the subtext of the curse that takes place. The curse falls on, on uh, Ham's seed. Um, the Hebrew term there that's being used, zera, uh, is a term that can be used both for seed as regards descendants and also a term for male sperm. So, in effect, that seems to be the subtext here. Because Ham offended with his seed, that is, in an act of immoral sexual intercourse with his father. Therefore, the curse falls upon the seed, that is, the descendants of Ham. Then we have the larger nexus of the story in ancient Israelite texts generally. When we look, for example, at Leviticus 18, the text that deals with the sex laws prohibiting certain forms of sexual immorality, here's a text that says, this is why the Canaanites are to be removed or expunged from the land because they committed all these sexual offenses and which include prominently incest and then also mention man-male intercourse which is particularly tagged with the label of tova or abomination. So here's a, a classic example of it. Uh, the ancestor of the Canaanites of Canaan uh, himself is guilty of multiple offenses along this order and in effect, in effect receives the same kind of curse that Leviticus 18 pronounces on the Canaanites because they commit these multiple offenses. Their ancestor himself is portrayed in Genesis uh, also as committing multiple heinous sexual offenses, not only coercive sexual activity, but also coercive homosexual practice and homosexual practice with his very own father, which would be uh, sex with one's parent one of the worst, most severe forms of incest. So really it's a kitchen, stink, uh, kitchen sink story, if you will, of sexual offenses. It also stinks, by the way. Uh, it's a kitchen sink story of sexual offenses in which multiple sexual offenses are taking place, showing that the Canaanite ancestor is unremittingly bad and explaining therefore why the curse takes place of removing the Canaanites from the land. Now, if in effect this is what the text is communicating, it's by the same author, as a story about the text in Sodom, uh, the text we find a story about Ham in, in Genesis 9. And what that means then is that, uh, well, if we ask here, is the only kind of a sexual offense that's being indicted in the Genesis 9 story about Ham the coercive act of sex with his father? Very few people would argue such a thing. And in fact, they would say, no, of course, it's also the incest that's also involved. Do not to have sex with your father. And um, Related to that, of course, would be the issue of homosexual practice. It's not just the coercive aspect per se, as if having sex with his parent would have been acceptable had he only asked his father and received his father's approval. Had that happened, his father would have been equally culpable in the offense. It wouldn't have reduced the severity of the offense of Ham of his son Ham. So in effect, what the story is communicating is a multiple series of offenses that are involved that are being indicted in this text, which is again suggestive of the Sodom story. Do we have only a coercive form of same-sex intercourse that's being indicted? No, more likely we have a kitchen sink story that involves a multiple range of offenses for which the Sodomites are being indicted, not only coercive sex, but same-sex intercourse, which dishonors the integrity of the male, of the integrity of the stamp of maleness on the visitors. In fact, this is what we get indicated in Levitical prohibitions. Uh, what would be wrong about having sex with another man with another man? The Levitical prohibitions say that you shall not uh, have sex with another man, with another male, as though with a woman. That is, as though with sexual intent and treating the other man as if he were the sexual complement or counterpart to a man, disregarding the maleness stamped on his gender,
and treating him as if he's a female, as somebody who receives uh, the male uh, <clears throat> in, in an integrated holistic act of sexual intercourse. It's not necessarily misogynist in his character, saying that women are bad and men shouldn't be treated like women because women are inferior, but rather the point being made in the story is that men are not female and females are, women are not men, and the integrity of their sex or gender needs to be respected in any act of sexual intercourse. What they bring to the table, so to speak, uh, sexually is the one sex that they are, not the sex that they are not. And to have sex with a person of the same sex implicitly makes the commentary that their own sex is only half intact. Not half intact in relation to the other sex, but half intact in relation to their own sex. If the logic of a heterosexual union is the two halves of the sexual spectrum unite into a single sexual whole, think about what the logic of a homosexual union is. Two half males become a whole male. Two half females become a whole female. You unite sexually with the one whom you perceive to be your sexual counterpart, your sexual other half. And if you're a man and unite sexually with another male, you're basically making a statement that you believe your maleness is only half intact, needing to be supplemented by sexual union with another man in order to make you a whole male. Now, this is, shouldn't be a, a source of ridicule or hate because some people do grow up with a perception that they're not really intact if men as male or if a woman as female, that they experience a certain deficit in their gender identity, a certain need to be um, approved and loved by important members of the same sex, to find affirmation of their sexual identities by same-sex parent or same-sex peers in a way in which they can feel loved and appreciated and to have their sexual identity approved as they are, as man or as woman. So, but the problem is if a man unites sexually with a person of the same sex, he simply regularizes the misperception that his gender, his maleness, is only half intact. That's why Paul uses the language of dishonoring for this kind of behavior, self-dishonoring, self-degrading behavior, because it treats that stamp of gender on them, if male as male, as only half intact in relation to their own sex. The problem then with what's going on at Sodom is the men of Sodom, in addition to being coercive, are basically treating the men as if they're only half male, which is an abuse or insult of what God has made them to be. And in that sense, they're attempting to humiliate them. Now you can then say, well, but humiliation isn't what we're talking about in the case of loving, committed homosexual unions. Well, we may not to overtly, deliberately, directly want to humiliate somebody of the same sex in a same-sex union, but that's the end result or end effect. Because by having intercourse with them, somebody of the same sex, you are making the statement that they're not entirely male. If you're male and you're trying to integrate sexually with another of the same sex, it's a way of asserting that one of you is not a whole male, either one or both. Now we get further confirmation for this reading of the Sodom text and other stories. Uh, there's a story uh, later on in Judges 19. The Sodom story, of course, is in Genesis 19. Story in Judges, Judges 19 is about a Levite who comes to a town called Gibeah. And uh, the same kind of stories we have in Sodom. The visitors in the town also want to have sex with him. And uh, in the end, he throws out his concubine. Uh, to They assault the concubine and, uh, and leave him alone. Now, the narrator in telling this doesn't approve of the behavior. Just as with the story of Lot throwing out his daughters, the narrator doesn't approve of the behavior. How do we know? Later on, uh, Lot's daughters wind up having sex with their father, uh, and this, and, and, in a sense, degrading, dishonoring him in doing so. So in a sense, it's a kind of payback that uh, Lot gets for throwing them out to the male 
uh, residents of the town. The narrator of the Sodom text implies that Lot should have trusted God because subsequently the angelic visitors, as told in the text, do blind the residents of the town of Sodom and they're able to get away without incident and then the town is destroyed. The implication by the narrator is if Lot had just trusted God and not sent anybody out, everything would have been all right. Same thing that happens in the case of the Levite at Gibeah in Judges 19. His offense in throwing out his concubine uh, to the residents of Gibeah is regarded as heinous and an example where everybody does what is right in their own eyes, as is an example of what the residents of Gibeah do. So it's not at all applauded by the narrator. Here we have a story in what scholars call in a larger body of text called the Deuteronomistic History. It's a material from Judges through Second Kings that is largely reliant on the theology that we find in the book of Deuteronomy. This is why we called it the Deuteronomistic History. It's a, it's a series of works written by the same author who is largely reliant on the Deuteronomic Law Code. And we have lots of other stories in the context of the Deuteronomistic History which tell us about what the narrator's view would have been of an act of same-sex intercourse between men. We hear a lot about a group of figures known as the Kadashim. This is Hebrew for literally the sacred ones, uh, the dedicated ones, the holy ones. And it's a self-designation used by some persons who are associated with a cult in connection with an androgynous deity who actively feminize themselves to attract male sex partners. They believe that the androgynous deity, uh, female deity who's able to take on male traits, uh, has basically taken hold of them and nullified their maleness so that in order to honor the goddess, uh, they take an active role in feminizing their appearance. Sometimes it can go as far as castrating themselves, sometimes just simply changing of clothing, makeup, and the like, hairdress. And by having sex with other men, they live out their true identity of who they are, which the goddess has made them to be. Now, their activity is regarded by the authors of the Deuteronomistic history. We don't know what we're talking, one author or many. We'll suppose one for a moment. The Deuteronomistic historian, scholars referred to as. Uh, we know what the Deuteronomistic historian thinks about the activity of these Kadashim. Uh, he calls their activity a toava, an abomination, the same expression that will be used by the author of the, the Levitical prohibitions in talking about man-male intercourse. Abomination simply means, not referring primarily to um, ritual activity, as we'll see later, but primarily moral activity. And it refers to activity that is abhorrent or detestable to God. Now, we could argue here that what was abhorrent or detestable to God about their behavior was the fact that uh, they were involved in an idolatrous ritual with a foreign goddess. Well, certainly that would be a problem, but it's not the only thing that was a problem because there are parallel figures in the ancient Near East called by other names, the Asinu, the Kugaru, and others. And they're an identifiable figure in the ancient Near East who are widely derided for attempting to efface their masculinity in an effort to have sex with other men. So these Kadashim that we find in ancient Israel parallel these other figures. And these other figures are indicted in the context of the ancient Near East precisely because of the disregard of the stamp of gender, of their maleness placed on their being. And that's undoubtedly then what the Deuteronomistic historian also found particularly offensive about them. We have a discussion of them in Deuteronomy itself where Deuteronomy also refers to them in these pejorative terms because of the actions that they engage in. So then within the same body of text, we find the story of the Levite at Gibeah uh, and the residents of, the, of Gibeah wanting to have sex with this male visitor. Again, what is most offensive about this story to the Deuteronomistic historian, in addition to the coercive sexual attack, 
is also the fact that they try to make this man's maleness of no effect, of no relevance in an act of sexual intercourse, and in a sense try to humiliate him by communicating that he's only half male, by being the recipient of sexual intercourse as the passive receptive partner with other men. So here we have another indication of a story that's very much like the story of the Sodom narrative, uh, in which it's clear that the narrator indicts not just the coercive activity, but the attempt at denying the actual maleness of the visitors through attempted sexual intercourse with other men. Not only do we have that story, but we also have the Levitical prohibitions themselves, which give us an end the array of Old Testament texts generally that speak to this issue. Uh, Leviticus, Levitical prohibitions are quite clear. You shall not lie with another male. Man shall not lie with a male as though with a woman. That is in sexual intercourse, with sexual intent. Not only that, but all the rest of the texts in the Hebrew Bible, every text in the Hebrew Bible that has anything to do with sexual ethics, whether we're dealing with narrative or we're dealing with legal material or proverbs or poetry or metaphor, any text of any genre in the Old Testament talking about sexual ethics always presupposes, without exception, a male-female requirement. This is not a minor element of the sexual ethics of the Old Testament. The reason why, for example, you do have laws in the Old Testament uh, describing both acceptable forms of, sexual, of heterosexual behavior and unacceptable forms of heterosexual behavior, but no laws in the Old Testament distinguishing between acceptable and non-acceptable forms of homosexual practice is because all homosexual practice is being viewed as wrong. There's no need to delineate between acceptable and unacceptable forms because it's tacitly understood in ancient Israel there are no acceptable forms. So this is not a minor feature as if we only have a few texts in the Old Testament that speak to the issue of homosexual practice. Every text having to do with sexual ethics always presupposes a male-female requirement. Even when you have metaphors, for example, God illustrating his relationship with Israel, the illustration is that of God as the husband and Israel as the wife. Even though Israel is a male-dominated society, so if Israel had no problem with homosexual practice, you would think Israel would illustrate itself as a man in relation in a sexual relationship with God as a male. They don't do that. And the reason why they don't do that is because all homosexual relationships are forbidden completely. So they have to illustrate themselves in that metaphor of God is to be a man, and this is to be viewed as a marriage relationship. They have to illustrate themselves as a woman, even though it's a male-dominated society. Just one of many examples that can be drawn on to show that a male-female requirement is not a minor element of Israelite sexual ethics. It's part of the whole fabric of the discussion of human sexuality in ancient Israel. Moreover, the history of the interpretation of the Sodom text makes absolutely clear that they're also indicting homosexual practice. Take, for example, Ezekiel 16. Uh, now, Ezekiel 16 actually refers back to the Sodom text. In Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel comments on the Sodom text. He says, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and your daughters had pride or arrogance and an oversatiation from food, complacency brought on by peace and quiet. And she, Sodom, did not take hold of the hand of the poor and the needy, did not help them. And they grew haughty, and they committed an abomination, a toavah, before me, and I removed them when I saw it. Now, here, Ezekiel is referring back to the Sodom episode. A lot of people want to argue, says, oh, well, all he was referring there is to the exploitation of the poor and needy. That was what was meant by committing an abomination. Now, we know, in fact, that that can't be what it meant, and here's how we know it. Later on in Ezekiel 18, just two chapters later, Ezekiel says, he talks about a series of vices and says that if a, if a person has born to him a son who commits any of these vices, uh, then uh, he shall certainly be put to death. His blood shall be on himself. His father's righteousness will not save him from having committed the offense that he commits, nor can it be, nor in the reverse, 
uh, if uh, his father is evil and he is good, his father's sins will not be placed on him. Each person will be held culpable for their own sin and not for the sins of their ancestors. And in the context of that remark in Ezekiel 18, a very clear distinction is made between oppressing the poor and needy and committing an abomination. The text says in Ezekiel 18, 12, and running through this list of sexual offenses, if a person oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not return a pledge, or lifts up his eyes to the idol, commits an abomination, tova, lends it interest and takes an extra, extra charge, shall he then live? He committed all these abominations, he shall certainly be put to debt. What I want you to note from that text is the expression oppressing the poor and needy is separated by several vices from committing an abomination singular. Therefore, it cannot be the same offense. Ezekiel cannot mean by committing an abomination, not helping the poor and needy, because in the context of Ezekiel 18, those things are distinguished. He talks about committing an abomination singular, and at the very end of all the offenses, he talks about they committed all these abominations. Now that's a very interesting change that's taking place here. It's the exact same change that we happen to find in the Levitical prohibitions in Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13. When we read those texts in Leviticus and read the prohibition of man-male intercourse, the text says that this is an abomination. He's committed an abomination. Then at the very end of these sexual offenses, after all of them are outlaid in Leviticus uh, 18, in the summary statement at the end of Leviticus 18, it refers to all the prior offenses, incest, adultery, man-male intercourse, bestiality. Um, all of those offenses are treated as abominations. But when he's talking about them individually, only one specifically re receives the tag of abomination toava singular, and that is man-male intercourse. That seems to be what Ezekiel is doing here. When he refers to commit an abomination singular in Ezekiel 18, he means man-male intercourse. And when he's referring to all the previous offenses as abominations plural to a vote, uh, that's the same thing that's happening in Leviticus 18. There is an abomination par excellence, if you will, man-male intercourse. In a diluted sense, all the offenses, sexual offenses, he says that I've just talked about are abominations. So seeing that same change in Ezekiel gives us the impression that Ezekiel is making the same kind of connection with abomination singular. And this is confirmed by other elements. We know, for example, that Ezekiel, who is a priest, knew the holiness code, Leviticus 17 to 24, or precursor document like it. This is acknowledged by all scholars of Ezekiel because there are a truckload of allusions in Ezekiel to that section of Leviticus. So uh, Ezekiel knew this text in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 22. He could see that Toavah singular was applied to man-male intercourse, and yet still other offenses outside of that could be called in the plural Toavoth or abominations. Moreover, we know that elsewhere, when he uses toava in the singular, abomination, Ezekiel in, is also referring to a sexual offense. In one other case, he may be referring to homosexual practice. In another case, he may be referring to adultery or, uh, incest or, or sex with a menstruating woman. In all cases, he seems to be using toava singular for sexual offenses. So it's likely we should expect a sexual offense here. What Ezekiel seems to be doing when he's reading the Sodom text is he's reading the Sodom text in light of the Levitical prohibitions. In fact, the very expression committed an abomination is the exact same expression in Hebrew that we find in Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13 with regard to man-male intercourse. It's not at all surprising that when, say, the medieval rabbinic commentator Rashi looks at the Ezekiel text, what does he say? He says, oh, Ezekiel is talking about man-male intercourse when he's talking about committed an abomination in Ezekiel 16, 49 to 50. Now, this is not a new construction that we get. This is an old interpretation of the text that we have. 
So that's an example of in the history of the interpretation of the Sodom story. Here within scripture itself, we see it being interpreted as the sin of same-sex intercourse is one of the elements that makes the sin of Sodom so bad. We can also look at the text in Jude uh, and in 2 Peter. In Jude 7, Jude 7 refers to like Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them and in the same manner they, having committed sexual immorality and gone after other flesh, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Now, a lot of people look at that text and look at the expression in particular of went after other flesh and they say, well, that, that can't mean homosexual practice. What that means, other flesh, is going after angels. And so, therefore, this text has nothing to do with man-male intercourse. Well, they're only half right when they say that. Going after other flesh does refer to having sex with angels. But the residents of Sodom did not know that they were having sex with angels. This is clear in the text in Genesis 19, and it's clear in all subsequent interpretation of this text. In fact, there's sort of a backhanded allusion to it in Hebrews 12 when it uh, asserts that we should uh, be hospitable as uh, Christians to others because we may be entertaining angels unaware. Uh, that's sort of a backhanded allusion to the entertainment of angels unaware that, that did not go on in Genesis 19 and should have. So the, the residents at Sodom, Jude is well aware, did not know that they were committing uh, sexual intercourse with angels. Uh, so he's not saying that's the only problem with what's going on in Sodom. Rather, we have here what's called a hendiatus, uh, that is, which means two in one. It, you take two different phrases, which are separated by and, and they're actually related to another, where one is subordinate to the other. The implication of this, this text, having committed sexual immorality and gone after other flesh, the implication of it is by virtue of committing sexual immorality, uh, that is having sex with other men, they got more than they bargained for. Namely, they wound up having sex with other flesh, that is with angels. What was the sexual immorality that they committed? In the context of the interpretation of the story that we find in early Judaism, it has to include the man-male dimension of the sex. When we look, for example, at Philo and Josephus, two Jews, uh, Philo a Jewish philosopher and and Josephus, a Jewish historian, both from the first century. When they look at these stories of Sodom, they interpret very clearly the man-male sexual intercourse going on as a significant element in the indictment of the Sodom story. Not merely just the coercion, but the fact of treating another man as only uh, half, his sexuality is only half intact in relation to other males. That they regard as a dishonoring, degrading activity to the man with whom the sexual intercourse is had. So there's no question then that Jude is reading this phrase about committing sexual immorality in the same light. Same thing with 2 Peter 2, 6 to 10, which talks about the licentious conduct of the lawless sodomites and God's judgment on them as a lesson to those who quote, go after, other, go after flesh by engaging in polluting, defiling desire. What is this polluting, defiling desire? Again, it can't be that they went after angels because they didn't know that they were angels. The defiling desire was a defiling desire for other men, men for men committing sexual immorality. So again, when we look at the Sodom story in light of a series of concentric circles of literary and historical context, we didn't even mention one, which is the ancient Near East context itself. When we look at texts from Mesopotamia or look at texts from Egypt, we see that men who feminize, actively feminize their appearance to attract male sex partners are regarded with disapproval in society generally. There's much more tolerance of this kind of behavior than what we would have in ancient Israel. But even many cultures within Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt regard this as problematic behavior, as offensive behavior, self-degrading behavior, on the part of those who participate in it. What's the likelihood then that in ancient Israel, which we know to be a culture much more strongly opposed to homosexual practice than anything we find in the prevailing culture in the ancient Near East, what is the likelihood that they would somehow have had some secret acceptance to committed homosexual unions when that's not even accepted generally in the ancient Near East? The likelihood is nil. So when we look at this wider context, look at other stories written by the same narrator. Again, the story about Ham and his father Noah. 
or the story of the creation text in Genesis 2, or we look at the ancient Near East generally, or we look at the parallel story of the Levite at Gibeah with their text about the Kadashim and the re, uh, assessment of their behavior as an abomination, or we look at other texts in the history of the interpretation of the Sodom text, whether we look at Ezekiel or Jude or Second Peter, uh, or if we look at the Levitical prohibitions and, and the general rejection of homosexual practice that prevails in the ancient Near East generally. At every single level, we find that the historical and literary context indicates that the problem going on at Sodom was not just rape, but also same-sex rape, that the same-sex or homoerotic dimension of the text is an integral element in the indictment of the story. Even Jesus, when he looks back at the story and wants to get a text from the Old Testament, which is a supreme example of um, an offense to visitors, he picks up this text at Sodom as the classic example. And Jesus says, look, I'm also being treated badly myself. Uh, and it will be worse for those who reject me even than it was for Sodom. Because, of course, Jesus is the final light given by God to the world. But he's still able to call what transpires at Sodom really bad. Because what did they do to the visitors? Not only coerced sex on them, but treated them in a degrading, dishonoring way by treating their masculinity as if it were of no effect, as if it were something that they are not. Many of you preached on marriage on June the 9th, Sunday. Thank you for doing that. There were thousands of pastors across America that participated. Thank you for doing that. But you're not too late. If you could not, for some reason, preach on marriage on that particular Sunday, pastors go right ahead and pick a Sunday sometime very soon, whenever's convenient for you. Some of you were in sermon series and couldn't break in at that time. Others of you didn't even know about this movement, pulpitfreedom.org. Pulpitfreedom.org is the place to sign up to be a part of this avalanche of truth we're spreading across America. As much as we can, we'd like to be before the Supreme Court announces its verdict on Prop 8 or on DOMA, Defense of Marriage Act. But even if you come after that announcement, by all means do that. Why, Pastor? Is because you have the ultimate last word. That is, God does. You really don't, but God does. Uh, God invented marriage, not the Supreme Court, not a state legislature, not the federal government. Marriage was designed by God from the beginning. You know how the Bible begins in Genesis with the marriage of a male and a female, and it ends in Revelation with the wedding of a bride and a groom. And in between, Jesus says in Matthew 19, we're created male and female, quoting from Genesis. And the two complementary halves of humanity come together. And what God has put together is to become one. What God has put together, let no one rip apart. In other words, what God has defined as marriage, no court, no legislator, no, not even the voting public can redefine. So you, pastor, as a spokesperson for God, you have the final word. You are representing the final authority. You're representing the ultimate chief justice of the universe. So even though that June 9th date passed that many of us chose to preach on marriage, you're not too late. Jump right in. Pick a Sunday. Sign up at pulpitfreedom.org. Pulpitfreedom.org. Sign up there and join the avalanche of truth being released across America that helps explain the definition of marriage. By the way, anytime the government has a vested interest in trying to redefine marriage, there are three casualties that are sacrificed at that altar. One is personal freedoms. The second one is parental rights. And the third is religious liberty. The radical homosexual agenda of redefining a marriage and religious liberties cannot coexist in the same culture at the same time. There's two locomotives. They're headed each other at full speed. One will survive when the day's over, either the radical homosexual agenda of redefining marriage or religious liberty. Not both can coexist in the same country at the same time. One of the high-level officials in the Obama administration has said the radical homosexual agenda, they're using other words than this, they were saying civil rights of homosexuals to redefine marriage is so important it trumps the First Amendment. It trump trumps all religious liberty. They cannot coexist, we would tell you, in the same nation. So you have the opportunity to spread the truth of God's word. Let's join together, all preach on this topic of marriage at approximately the same time. So select a date, pulpitfreedom.org is the place to sign up. Thank you so much for doing that.